I'm really excited about this one because over the years in the space of, of CTA, I think we struggled a little bit on the strategic side and sometimes connecting with our business partners or business peers and things along those lines. So this talk here um, is going to talk about strategic um, ROI, but it's also going to have some applications on the um, operational side. This is going to be around uh, M&A. So let's go ahead and bring uh, Bethany and Aurelia on. We're both on the intelligence team at Cargill, and they're going to introduce themselves. Hi. They've got a slide uh, for that. Um, but, but Bethany, uh, like me, is a former uh, U.S. Army uh, person, so I just want to give a shout out to the Army. Yes, awesome. Army, go Army, beat Navy. Um, all right, Aurelia, you good? Yeah, I'm good to go. All right, cool. Let's, let's kick this off. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, Rick gave us a little bit of an intro, but we'll also introduce ourselves here. So I'm Bethany. I'm the Cyber Intel Manager here at Cargill. Um, I've been with Cargill for about four years, but like Rick said, previously I was an Army Intel officer. Um, I, there I spent some time in the Middle East, uh, most recently with Special Operations. So right now I live in Minnesota with my husband, uh, two kids, two dogs, and a cat. So consequently, I'm very tired. And there you can see an actual representation of how much coffee I go through in a week. So Aurelia. It's true. Uh, so hey, everyone. I'm Aurelia Rodriguez. I'm the Strategic Cyber Intel Analyst here at Cargill. And I've been here for about nine months, give or take. Um, I've spent most of my time in the career on the government side of the house. I started off at Fort Meade as an Intel Analyst with the Air Force, uh, as I'm sure many of you can relate to. Um, I've got my bachelor's in intelligence studies with a concentration in cyber. And I live in my hometown of El Paso, Texas with my husband and four kids. And just a quick shout out to Lillian uh, for her talk earlier. She's really inspirational. And just because of her, I'd like to share that I'm a first generation Mexican-American here in, in the US. So very, very inspirational talk from Lillian. Thank you for that. Um, and then like everyone here, um, I've got had to get a little creative with uh, how to deal with the pandemic myself. So here you'll see a picture of what I affectionately call my new therapist. And uh, I do feel I need to mention though that uh, I do take it pretty easy on the bike, unlike Mr. Big, so don't worry about me. I'm gonna be okay. Um, so welcome everybody. We're excited here to talk about OSINT. Cool, all right. So a um, little bit about us. So we are a team of four, obviously. I'm the manager, Aralia said she is the strategic analyst. We also have an operational analyst, Mike. You can see him over in our hallway. Um, he tracks current campaigns, uh, things like nation states. He loves criminal actors. You know, you want to make his day, ask him about Wizard Spider. Um, we also have a tactical analyst, Corey. I think he'll be showing up in our hallway too. So he manages our threat intel platform, um, everything IOCs, really looking, you know, more specifically at TTPs and behaviors. And he's our main interface with security teams like vulnerability management and incident response. And my uh, Corey is also um, an Army veteran. So right now, all of us, all four on our team, we're North America based, but our gre greater cybersecurity team is located globally. All right, so Cargill. Um, we like to call Cargill the greatest company or the largest company you've never heard of. So Cargill is a 155 year old private organization. We have 155,000 employees spread across 70 countries. Um, we're the largest private company in America. So primarily we're a food and ag company. We also have a financial and uh, industrial section of the company. Um, we have five distinct businesses under our overall organizational umbrella. Um, as you can imagine, we're an integral part of the global food supply chain. So our headquarters are based here in Minnesota. And right now I think it's something like negative 30 Fahrenheit with the wind chill. So if you're thinking about like moving here or, you know, tourism, visiting, um, it's really lovely this time of year. So, you know, lots of good stuff to keep in mind. All right, if slides will move forward, that would be great. There we go. All right. so. How did the Cyber Intel team at Cargill end up getting involved in the mergers and acquisition due diligence process? So really this started prior to my arrival four years ago. Um, I actually came in in Aurelia's position as the strategic analyst, but then the process wasn't really well established. Um, 
it had some struggles to identify what information was important to the business and how we as a team reported that information up to stakeholders. So we really kind of worked with this over the course of a couple of years. We evolved our processes. Um, quite honestly, we did a lot of trial and error. We cycled through different tool sets and methodologies of how to use those tools. Um, but frankly, what helped us the most were honest conversations with stakeholders, and that really shaped how we thought about collection, what we collected, and how we reported it. Um, and also, you know, being able to accurately identify and describe within a business context um, the increased cyber risks present in M&A due diligence, this helped us, you know, better illustrate to stakeholders the need for an intel assessment. So um, way back when originally this started, we were often notified days before an M&A deal was imminent. You know, shockingly, that's too late if you find anything bad. Um, and in some cases, even after a deal was complete. So honestly, we just forged ahead. You know, it took us a couple years. We were just consistent and we delivered timely, tailored, concise and accurate reports to our M&A stakeholder. Um, this led that stakeholder to successfully lobby on our behalf. And now our assessment is much earlier in the due diligence process. Um, and also, you know, we have a really close relationship now to that team and they've decided to trust us with access to additional restricted information, which previously we didn't have access to. So now that information really helps us with both our greater analysis and additional pivots. All right, so things that um, also helped us communicate to stakeholders to help make that good case for involving cyber intel in m a um, Frankly, high profile open source stories in the media, you know, things where risk assessments um, either weren't done or didn't uh, think to include digital asset integration. So um, we're not going to name names. But several years ago, there was a large hospitality chain that suffered a massive data breach. And this came um, after they had done an acquisition from a, another hospitality chain partner, and they had previously had some incidents. Now, had they perhaps, I'm not speaking for them because I don't know the details of that, but that, that stands in you know, pretty stark contrast to what else is out there. That helped us illustrate to stakeholders, you know, hey, doing some extra due diligence, ensuring that there are things that you know, we can identify, um, that might help you know, stakeholders shape how they think about this deal process. You know, and, and cyber intelligence, um, you know, through this can also really drive business revenue. You know, I think this is one thing we don't always think about, but if we make accurate assessments for growth opportunities and are also able to mitigate risk, um, you know, within the context of M&A, that can confirm claims or reveal new information that may influence negotiations. So, you know, things like data breaches, poor patching, um, high profile employee online behavior and dark web mentions for things like, you know, creds for seller access that all helps, you know, stockpile the due diligence team's toolkit for negotiations. Um, so that's a lot of information, but if we were going to boil it down, there, there's one thing that our team firmly believes in. Um, we believe that, that cyber intelligence is a unique discipline and that this can complement traditional M&A risk assessments and overall provide strategic value back to the business. All right, so I don't often like to read slides verbatim, but we think that these are really important. So, um, you know, we are here to provide information that's relevant and specific to the organization. You know, we are helping enable business leaders to make decisions about both risk and opportunity. Um, providing context, we are providing context to the technological world that our organization operates in, you know, most importantly to secure things like intellectual property and competitive advantage. Uh, this next point is really important. Everything we do needs to be repeatable, measurable, sustainable, and auditable. Um, here, our team just wrapped up a couple of audits, and I'll be very honest, they were fairly painless. You know why? Because we followed this process. We wanted to make sure that everything we did was documented, so when asked for it, it was already there. Um, and also from you know, a, a team efficiency standpoint, we need to make sure our work is repeatable. So if anyone's out on PTO, you're sick, vacation, a weekend, your other teammates can just follow through. You know, you're not a single point of failure. People are our greatest asset. Here we invest in our people. And then finally, my favorite, and I think 
the most important point here, adapt or, die, or, adapt or die or risk being outsourced. Um, you know, here within our industry, we need to continuously adapt and flow in the direction of our organization or we risk being outsourced. You know, we're gonna become completely obsolete. You know, like this guy in the picture and his outfit and his hardware there on the desk. All right. So um, if you have a background in the government, IC or military, this slide is gonna look really familiar. So we've obviously reworked um, the traditional doctrinal intel cycle, and we've put it into words and descriptions that better suit the business and can help educate stakeholders, um, you know, or people who just don't have a background in IC military or government. So we feel that this really helps them visualize the overall framework and um, shows them, you know, how we operate, you know, what guides are thinking and, and how we uh, attack projects. So, you know, we don't have the luxury of assuming that everyone or stakeholders, you know, A, know what intelligence even is, and then also what it can do for them. Um, you know, here I want to make a quick side note and go back to Lillian's talk. You know, our industry has a lot of veterans, myself, the majority of our team, my boss, their, you know, sister teams around us within our greater cybersecurity footprint. There's a lot of us. I love it. You know, makes me feel at home. But we also need to identify what Lillian said and start bringing in people with non-traditional backgrounds into our industry. You know, they can help us see things differently and identify gaps, you know, that inherently our own group thinking bias may not let us see. Um, you know, so this frankly was one of them. I liked the doctoral intel cycle. It made me feel warm and fuzzy. Like, oh yes, I also have read, you know, JP2-0. I know where this came from, but that didn't work in the business. So we had to um, identify that that was a bias and we had to change it. All right, so jumping back in to Intel cycle, um, you know, planning and research, you know, in the phases. And if you're looking at the icons, we're going clockwise, starting from the top. Planning research, everyone gets that. All right, analysis, everyone thinks they get this. But a lot of times we see things missing context. And when you are organic to an organization, you are the SME of the organization. You know, why does this matter to Cargill? Sometimes we even come right out and say, why does this matter to Cargill? So that we are showing our stakeholders that yes, we are intelligence professionals who happen to be SMEs in the cyber environment, but we're also SMEs to our organization as our SME subject matter expert. We are, you know, bringing together these two different um, things that we are subject matter experts in. And that is why our analysis and context is the best for our organization because we know it best. Um, next, sharing is caring. You know, uh, the best analysis and products are a total waste if we don't share them in a way that's meaningful, ingestible, or educational for our customers. And then finally, learning. Um, you know, we, we really need to be self aware you know, improve. And with self-awareness comes being open to feedback and criticism. So example of this, previously on our team uh, years ago, we used to spend a lot of time writing really formal products. Um, you know, they had footnotes, like pretty headers. They were, they were really nice. Stakeholder feedback. They wanted analysis that was much faster, that didn't take as long to format and put in the really pretty PDF. They wanted it in an email body, um, gut feel, you know, what do you think and why? And then they wanted to be able to forward that email throughout the organization or up through the, the hierarchical chain. We pivoted. Now our, our process is much faster. We actually end up engaging with a larger, more meaningful audience. We are now reaching stakeholders much farther up in our organization. And then, you know, because it's in an email chain and yes, you know, there's good and bad with that, um, it's auditable. And we can continue, we can contribute within that email body as people ask questions and, you know, we can kind of maintain um, a little bit more control over, you know, who's in that chain to see what we're saying. Uh, we already talked about it, you know, but for M&A due diligence, we worked a similar change with our stakeholder so that the information we were reporting was presented in a more meaningful way. All right, so this is now where we come back to that adapt or die or be outsourced. Uh, truth. As an industry, we need to change how we think about intelligence. And I get that saying we need to move beyond IOCs. Um, this might be kind of a significant emotional event for some people, but we need to be really honest and clear. We need to move beyond IOCs. All right. 
So intelligence as a concept, right, you know, and as a function grows in value when we mature. And as we mature, we inherently become more strategic and predictive uh, back to the business and to our security stakeholders. Within this, we have to speak the language of the business. We have to be able to relate our expertise and our findings in a way to, you know, I, that context, what matters to the business. We have to be able to integrate ourselves with the business, you know, build those relationships and trust. Um, a couple of weeks ago, there was a TechCrunch article and the title was The Coming Reckoning, Showing ROI from Threat Intel. You know, it talked about how we need to grow our skills beyond just supplying the stock with data. We have to move up the pyramid of pain. We have to automate IOCs. You know, again, if we can't show our value beyond IOCs, um, we risk losing the business community. They may lose faith in what intelligence can offer them. And again, the risk finding yourself outsourced, you know, investing in our people, you know, people are our greatest asset. We don't need to waste human capital on IOCs and data that we can automate, you know, focus our people assets on using them to grow strategically, you know, even the best data um, needs a human story. It needs narration. It needs someone to tie it together. That context being the, the SME for the business, that's where people are most important. Um, you know, Lillian mentioned the tyranny of day-to-day -day fires and the burnout. Yes, we need to stop the tyranny, uh, you know, of living under this, putting out fires day-to-day -day and focus on planning and structure and not just reaction to stimulus. You know, so when we broaden our focus on the long-term impact to the business, you know, that helps us be predictable and relatable to the business. All right, so pulling this all together now and focusing back on uh, the m and due diligence process. So first let's talk about scope, passive collection only. We only do passive collection. You know, um, obvious reasons, this avoids tipping off the target. Sometimes target organizations uh, beyond just their leadership and board, they may not know they're for sale, right? So you don't want to tip off their own security teams, um, you know, or potentially let them know that there is a sale pending underway that could cause an, you know, inadvertent insider threat issue. Um, you know, there's some pretty obvious legal implications for doing active collection on, on another company, right? Don't go there. Um, you know, also, you don't want to break someone's hardware by scanning something. Um, you know, overall, we do nothing invasive, illegal, or unethical. All right, so now looking at the M&A process, there are two main phases here, pre-deal and post-deal. So in pre-deal, when we look at the process of what we're going to do, we want to identify things that might influence either negotiations or the deal itself. You know, is anything adverse happened that the target either knows of or sometimes they don't know they've been the victim of something? Um, what's their current cybersecurity posture? Uh, are there unique reputational risks that can be discovered using um, OSINT or other advanced tools? And then finally, we also look at it from the perception of post deal. What happens after this goes through? What does our organization need to know? You know, we need to um, help the integration team uh, figure out, you know, how are they going to bring this, this company into our network or not? You know, can we provide them with some enumerated infrastructure, um, help them shape their integration phases? You know, this information is really important because then they can identify obstacles, you know, like, do we have to patch the entire organization for, you know, Log4j? Um, are they using Microsoft Exchange? Whatever. What will cause disruptions or delays to that integration process? All right, and now I'm gonna get ready to hand this over to Aurelia. Thanks. So as uh, one of the newest members on the team, I had the opportunity to help refine our process with a fresh perspective. So like Bethany said, what information can we find during the pre-deal phase that may put our organization in an advantageous pos uh, position during negotiation? So like she said, all our research is gonna be done on an anonymized browser. And the tools that we're leveraging are only going to do passive collection. So that's one thing that's really great about OSINT, open source intelligence, is that there's really no single way to do it. Um, there's several approaches that an analyst could take to, to achieve the end state. So what we did here is very simply just came up with a generic taxonomy that can essentially capture all of our findings, all the data that we're pulling from all our tools, and uh, put it in a format that's going to be easily readable for, for our consumer. 
And then, of course, depending on your industry and the time constraints and how much time you're given and the budget, um, you know, our our template may not persistently like work for you, but it's something that can be simply um, modified to, to fit your needs. So for brand reputation, obviously, you want to know if the company has been in the news recently, if it has, you know, what is the nature of the articles that are being uh, tossed around on the Internet? Uh, are they involved in any lawsuits? Uh, what's the nature of those? Um, social media is actually, you know, pretty helpful and useful when you want to learn about consumer sentiment towards the company. Um, what sort of job openings does the company have listed? So, you know, after a pretty significant incident this last summer, one of the things that we observed was that uh, almost immediately after the, the ransomware attack was made public, the company was posting, um, you know, CISO and cybersecurity positions online, and it highlighted a very obvious gap in their security procedures that they obviously didn't have and, you know, eventually ca caused the, the ransomware attack that happened. So um, for digital infrastructure, um, you know, we're gonna have to have, we have all our tools set up and everything's refined. Um, what can we learn about the company's digital infrastructure? Uh, how diverse is their environment? You know, do they have mobile devices, IoT? operational technology, you know, and if they do, can we determine using our tools if their security measures are adequate for those for those devices? Um, we can find out what email services they're using, things like that. Uh, for digital hygiene, we, we like to call upon our vulnerability management team and our purple teams to collaborate with us because um, they do have some more sophisticated tools that might be able to illuminate additional information for us. And so you know, in, in that take, like, can we find some lessons learned or AAR reports for the for the target organization that might uh, describe some cyber events in the past? Um, can we determine if they're patching appropriately? All those things come into play uh, towards the end, and that will help our due diligence team in the end come to the table with some more additional questions and follow ups for during the deal. Um, and then finally, for our results and findings, you know, we're going to take all this information, all this data and and Put it in a way that the due diligence team is going to consume it um, and it's going to be helpful for them. Uh, slide please. So I don't know about you but and as soon as I start pulling data and I start getting pretty inundated really quickly and, and it, it can be pretty overwhel overwhelming really quickly. So um, on the left you'll see a very simple workflow that we came up with. Um, there's really nothing fancy about it. It's just a, a Word document with a table in it. Um, but the point is here that it's something that you can easily use for your own organization or a start off point to, to create your own program at your organization. Um, and it's gonna help you capture all these, these disparate data that, that, we're, that we're pulling in from our tools. And then second on the right, if you've ever taken the SANS OSINT class, it's called SEC 487, you might recognize this mind map. Um, and it's super helpful because it helps us break out our collection strategy in a way that's uh, easily to, easy, easily to visualize. Uh, as we head down our research process project. Um, main point here is you want to take all that data and you want the data to drive your research. Um, you don't want to get inundated too quickly and just uh, come to a conclusion that there's nothing happening, but you do want to find some pivot points to, to which to continue your, your research from. Slide, please. So here is our obligatory graph slide as with any an <laughs> analysis uh, presentation. So we use Maltigo for the bulk of our MA research. Um, and I'm, 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 I've seen Maltigo graphs uh, yesterday and today. So uh, if you've never heard of Maltigo, it's just a very powerful intelligence and forensic application that uh, essentially lets us run searches from disparate data sets uh, that are available on, in open source. So this is a quick footprint of the sans.org domain. Um, we've actually cleaned this up pretty significantly. As you can guess, the sans.org um, domain is pretty complex, but just to, to make the image a little easier to digest here on the slide, uh, we're showing that Maltigo was able to enumerate several portions of the infrastructure, including their servers and mail exchange services. So here we can identify IP ranges um, and, uh, and things like that that will help, that will serve as pivot points for when we collaborate with our wall team or our, our purple team as well. Um, and you can even break these out even further and find things like net blocks, um, ISPs, locations. Um, you can even find certificates to see if they're valid and up to date. Um, the main point we're trying to highlight here is that we're finding additional points to pivot from so that we can continue our research. Um, and then, for example, we can take some of these IP addresses or subdomains and just run them through Shodan or run them through domain tools or something like that. 
slide, please. So here is a list of some more tools that we like to use. Uh, some of these vendors offer free or affordable versions as well as enterprise versions of their tools. Um, the key takeaway here is that most of these can be used today, regardless of your of your budget um, and your time constraints. It's just a matter of simple installation and you know running on your machine right now. Um, you'll have the freedom to scale the use of the tools to fit your needs. And the free versions are still really great and really powerful. But the main difference will be um, you might need some additional time to conduct your research, or you might need uh, some additional tools to complement the findings that you have for the re free versions. Uh, Recon NG and Spiderfoot both offer community versions, and the polls may be a little bit difficult and time consuming to parse through, but still really great uh, if you're limited on budget. Um, Shodan, love it or hate it, uh, it provides really good information and it helps determine digital hygiene, which is something that's very important when you're considering uh, integrating with another network. Um, for intelligence platforms, I know we, we have several to choose from, and I'm sure many of them are here today uh, representing their organization. So we, um, we, we'd like to use them to create keyword alerts for the target organization. And that helps us see um, mentions of the, of the company either in the deep in the dark web um, or, or on Twitter or social media and things like that. That'll help us, again, determine the consumer sentiment towards this company. Um, and then one of my favorites is the Authenticate Silo browser. It essentially just provides misattribution while you're surfing the net. Slide, please. So we've mentioned before, um, we like to include our vulnerability management team and our threat hunt and purple teams as well, um, because they have, you know, they have a different perspective and a different separate insight that that might help um, bring the whole picture together. Um, our pen test teams can use some of their tools that are more sophisticated and can help us come to some more conclusions. But again, I'll foot stomp that we are not doing anything intrusive. Everything that we're doing is collective, is passive collection. I'm sorry. Um, and that also goes for the pen testers and the purple teams whenever we call upon them to assist on our research. Slide, please. All right, so we're done with all our research. We've got our uh, purple team and Threat Hunt and everyone else's uh, input for the, for the product. And we're ready to type up the final product. Um, again, to go back to what Bethany was mentioning, you know, we had in the past, we'd had these really long academic papers that uh, the due diligence team really couldn't get a lot of use of unless they actually spent a long time reading and going through everything. So for our team, we've we've noticed that really quick, a bluff, uh, an exec sum right up front with the findings that are important and, and their recommendations and the follow-up questions that we need to provide right up front for them. Um, and then right, uh, right after that, we like to include our table with the very granular details of all the things that we found. Um, and then as also, I've also found it's very helpful to find or to provide screenshots of some of the some of the, the pieces of information you might have found that you know with a, a written description really won't meet uh, the won't be enough for for the due diligence team to answer questions. So, and then in contrast for the post deal, you know for the integration team they're going to want all the nitty gritty details right up front. Um, they're going to need they're going to use those technical those de technical details to come up with their their course of action for the integration plan. Um, and then lastly, it's a good idea to continue to monitor the keyword alerts that we created in our intelligence platforms. Uh, naturally, after the, the transaction happens and, and the announcement is, is made public, there's going to be an uptick in mentions of the companies that are involved in the transaction. So we like to monitor that to see what, what the internet is saying about, about the acquisition or the merger. Um, this is also helpful, as we saw a um, little bit late, late during last year, the year of ransomware, where uh, threat actors were going after the acquisitions and mergers that were being publicly made to target for their next victim. So um, super helpful. And that's pretty much my end. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bethany. Thanks, Aurelia. OK, so um, Aurelia already kind of mentioned some of this, but the intel cycle doesn't end after the deal goes through. You know, we need to bring things full circle. So um, she just talked about how we enter the acquisition organization into our intel platforms for keyword alerting. And this lets us know about those dark web mentions, you know, especially, you know, small indicators like credentials for sale, access for sale or um, you know, vulnerability, vulnerabilities affecting known tools or softwares that they use. Um, 
But most importantly, you have to do this in alignment with your stakeholders, keep them in the loop. So for us on our team and our security uh, organization, it's the business information security officers. So these are the people who interface directly from the security organization to the business leadership. Um, so, you know, often we'll work with them. And if there are too many, you know, uh, targets or keywords for us to put into our platform in a way that's manageable, we'll work with them to identify, say, like tiers or, you know, if you could pick your top 20, which ones would they be that you're most concerned about? So then they have a little bit, um, you know, they, they have some stake in this too, right? Because they've helped us, you know, identify what might have higher risk or not. Um, you know, so this information, you know, it's bi-directional. We inform the BSOs, the business information security officers, you know, this helps them inform the business so the business can continue to make informed decisions. And then also we share this with the rest of the security organization um, so that, you know, they can have their own informed security decisions, bringing things full circle. All right. So we've talked a little bit about our journey and, and our current you know, state where we are in our own evolution with this. We've talked about some of our lessons learned and how we got here. We've talked about how to scale um, things for your own budget and organizational needs, but how do you start an M&A due diligence program with your cyber intel team? Number one, build buy-in, gain trust. You know, um, we also need to emphasize that just because this is what our journey looked like and this is what process and methodology works for us, this will look different for every organization. So, you know, identify what you can affect and start with that. Um, using those open source case studies to illustrate risk and opportunity, that large hospitality chain data breach, that one, that one really wakes people up. Um, and it's, it's well known enough and is covered by enough, uh, you know, well known media that people pay attention to it. And chances are they've also already heard of it. You know, OSINT research, this can have tremendous value if done well and done correctly, you know, but OSINT is constantly changing. So it also is a good exercise that you um, can consistently practice. You know, building that list of resources and tools. Um, you know, first I would say, identify what you need to know and what you need to collect and then find your tool. I think a mistake a lot of teams and people make is they say, well, I want this tool or I have this tool and I'm going to build out everything based on what that tool can do. That's backwards. You know, first identify your priorities. What do you need to know? And then start to look for what can help fill those gaps for you. You know, those free affordable ones, use them. You know, get your leadership buy-in. Contact your company's M&A section. Maybe they're in business development or, you know, business strategy, corporate strategy. Um, and then also, you know, you can use your company's own, you know, after they um, have done a merger and acquisition, even if it's years ago and it is publicly known and that there was, you know, your company's PR department issued a statement on it and was, you know, elsewhere. Go back, do that legacy merger and acquisition. Um, it's often good practice for your own methodology and you can always bring your findings to your section. And then finally partner with other teams, even external to your security organization. So for us, that was the communications team. We realized that we were identifying brand reputation issues. I don't really want to cover brand reputation because that seems like a communications thing. But we realized that our tools were pulling in different information from different external sources than theirs were. So um, we just got together and said, we want to help you and help each other, you know, make it, make it a mutual thing. You're both on the same strategic journey together. All right, build it out, additional use cases. Um, this methodology and these tools, frankly, complement a lot of other team strategies and really specific within the security organization. Supply chain security, oh my gosh, hugely visible risk. You know, people still like start shaking when you talk about solar winds and Kaseya. OSINT methodologies, use them. These can identify those potential risks that you have with, you know, application onboarding, third party risk management, digging into supply chain security, you know, looking at what are you actually bringing into your organization. Um, it also identifies natural touch points with other teams. We've already talked about like purple team, pen test, application security infrastructure. You know, cyber intel is integral to everything. Intel drives everything across your organization or it can if you identify those opportunities. 
And that's all we've got. So thanks from the Cargill cow.